First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't generate amusing holiday cards, but it will personalize career paths for your people and let you know which suppliers are best so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. I'm Inc. Executive Editor Diana Ransom, and you are listening to Inc. Uncensored. Today's episode, Life Cycle of Entrepreneurship. At Inc., we focus a lot on how people become entrepreneurs. But today, we're going to explore what it's like to start a company and then sell it. What do you do after you founded your company, turned it into a successful business, and then decided to move on? We'll hear some of the best advice from a founder whose company became a billion-dollar unicorn. Sanira Madani, founder of Stacks Payments and host of CEO School, the podcast. Having that entrepreneurial instinct relies a lot on trusting your gut, which is something Sanira knows well as does our other guest. I'm Ron Shaikh. I am the uh, founder and uh, former CEO of Au Bon Pen, the founder and former CEO of Panera Bread, and I am the managing partner of Act 3 Holdings. And in that role, I am the chairman and a lead investor in Kava, uh, the chairman at Tate, the chairman at uh, Level 99, chairman at uh, Life Alive, and a number of other businesses. And you're, you're listening, listening to Ink Uncensored. Uncensored. Ron and Sanera took different paths that led them to success as entrepreneurs, but they also found they shared a lot in common. While we discussed navigating exit strategies, I wanted to kick off the conversation by asking Sanera where her entrepreneurial journey began. I built this business from the ground up, had no idea that I would go on to, you know, even how to build a million dollar business, let alone exiting a billion dollar business. Didn't go to CEO school and just put one foot in front of the other and scale the company as best as I could. And it was the hardest and the best journey that I've done in my career. And recently, this last year, exited as CEO and have gone on to create an amazing team and culture that's going to sustain itself beyond myself and kind of like finished that journey with my first baby. Alongside, you know, of building Stacks, I uh, founded a podcast called CEO School, which I launched in 2020 when we were all in the pandemic and um, had a little bit of extra time not commuting. And that community of female entrepreneurs has grown just so incredibly and it is, you know, a top 100 podcast. Inc. actually, you all, you know, celebrated our one millionth download at Inc. headquarters this last year. And so we have a community of, you know, half a billion subscribers through our Instagram and through our channels. And it's just such an incredible, incredible community. I also sit on several boards and support women in business as an investor, as well as through various boards. However, my favorite role that I play is I am a mother of two young daughters, Mila and Anna, who are seven and four. And Ron, humor us here. I know you've had quite the journey. So yes. walk us through your entrepreneurial career. It's, you know, it's an overnight success in, <laughs> in 40 years. I, I started with a single cookie store in downtown mm-hmm. Boston, led to a company called Au Bon Pain, ultimately transformed into Panera. That was the company that went public. In 2017, 30 odd years later, we sold it for seven and a half billion dollars. Now, the interesting part, people often talk about the financial results. We were the best performing restaurant stock for the last two decades that we were a public company. But they talk about the fact that we delivered returns twice Starbucks, four times Chipotle, 25% annualized returns over, over those two decades better than Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. But the part that's the most interesting and exciting to me is the transformations we made. Because what leadership of any enterprise is about is about transforming into the future before that future arises. And so for me, what I think about is that Obon Pen originally started as a bakery and we could see and learn, because learning is really the power. We could see and learn that people didn't want the croissant and bread. They wanted to use the croissant and bread as a platform for their sandwich and we converted to a cafe. And I watched as we made that transformation of the power of it. I saw the same thing in the early 90s when everybody was saying the only thing that people wanted was fine dining and fast food. And it struck me, I I traveled the country and one out of three consumers, one out of three would be walking into fast food and holding their noses. And it didn't seem 
so brilliant, but nobody was doing it to say, what happens if we serve food that people respected, served it in environments that engaged them, had people that actually cared? Would that change it? And what was miraculous to me is we ended up building Panera as the poster child for that and the reaction in this country. And people like us, people like Howard Schultz at Starbucks, later Steve Ells at, at Chipotle, that vision, that understanding, that learning became a $100 billion plus segment of the restaurant industry. And it's all about that learning process. And then third, 1999, I had a large public company, four divisions. Again, I'm on the beach in the Caribbean with a friend and I'm kind of lamenting. I said, I have this thing called Panera. It has the potential to be a nationally dominant company. But for every thousand companies that talk it, one ever makes it. And I said, I'm really worried. We're going to screw it up. It's one of our four divisions. And this friend looked at me and said, Ron, what would you do if Panera owned Obon Pen, Obon Pen International, and the manufacturing business? And I looked at my friend and I said, if I had any guts, I'd monetize every other asset. I would take the best people. I'd go down there myself and take all that capital and invest it and ensure that this company, Panera, fulfilled its destiny. And I'm a kind of person that if I say I'm going to do it, I go do it. I thought about it and I said, I'm going to go do it. And three months later, I went to my board with the idea of selling everything in the company but one division. How do you know you're on the right track? Like, how do you know that you're not just batshit and people are going to look at you like you're crazy? I can feel it. You can, right? I can absolutely feel it in my stomach. The best moment in all of business is when you have figured something out. Yeah, but don't don't you always feel that way? No, I don't. Actually, let me just go back to that because I reread that section of your book twice because it was it didn't sound easy to me. Like, and I was like, wait, (laughs) none of these transitions sound easy. (laughs) He took Obon Pan and then he was going to have Panera. Like, I had to read it twice, and it didn't seem like it was an easy time making that transformation. Whoa, whoa, whoa! We're separating two different things. One is the question of understanding it, feeling it, and knowing it. The other is executing it. And they're very different. You have to begin by telling yourself the truth. You then have to really figure out what's going to matter and matter in two years, three years, five years, and 10. And then no bullshit. You got to get it done. And Sonera, how did, how did you know that you were on the right track? Or how did you feel like leaving potentially was the right thing to do? Or anytime you faced a transition? I think when what Ron said is when you feel it, you feel it. I think that that part of entrepreneurial instinct is so important. And I think our gut is our biggest tool that we have in, in the toolbox. However, when you also pair, you know, Sal and I have the saying of like fact plus gut. Sal is your Sal co-founder. Sal is my co-founder, mm-hmm. my brother as well. So we built the company together. The gut is so important to lean on. But then when you have the right data also to support the gut, then it's so much easier to get everybody else on board. And I will say that my journey probably, and I don't want to discount, I don't know Ron's journey, so I don't know how what your journey looked like when you went to the board and you had big ideas. But I would say that my journey was really difficult in the ideas that I had in shaping, you know, we were in in tech and in fintech. Having big, crazy ideas in Silicon Valley was respected, but it wasn't in the financial services industry. It wasn't in payments. Even just the way that we were doing our pricing model at Stacks was so unique. We were the first subscription-based credit card processor to come to market. And it was so novel and so unique, and it was hard. Even though I knew in my gut at every step of the way that this was going to be successful and I would will my way its way to success, I was 26 years old with no credibility, with no, you know, Ivy League degree, without the network, without the things. And so I did feel like it was a, for me, I knew I felt it in the gut, but I had a lot of convincing to do to go get that part of it respected and validated. And so for me, the way that I was able to do that was always pairing it with fact plus gut. And so that's kind of maybe a little bit of my defense mechanism with the the data side of it is like I knew in my gut I didn't need the I didn't need the data, but I had to have the data to get the support that I needed at every step when I had a crazy idea. I'd, I'd offer this. Gut is simply internalized analysis. Yes. Right? It doesn't come from nowhere. It actually has to come through processing. And and the reality of learning, which is really what we're talking about, yeah. that's where all growth occurs. Learning is pattern recognition. Learning is about taking generalizations from one industry and transferring it to another. Learning is empathy. Learning is about listening to other people. And my argument about entrepreneurship to what you're speaking to is entrepreneurs are not risk takers. What entrepreneurs really are at their core 
are people that see opportunities, can feel opportunities, understand opportunities that other people don't. And when they see that opportunity, they latch on and don't let go. The greatest risk to me as an entrepreneur was to not see that opportunity out, to lose it. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I optimized everything against what I understood. Well, you also, you know, what you said about execution, I thought was really, really fair and really, you know, important to home in on because you can have a big dream, right? And you can have this gut feeling, but like actually executing on it is is a whole nother story. And it often separates the entrepreneurs from, you know, the would-be entrepreneurs. So can you talk a little bit about your strategy for execution? Execution is everything. Yeah. Ideas are a dime a dozen. Everything is credibility. And if you're talking about bringing capital, if you're talking about bringing team members along on the ride, Mm -hmm. the truth is everything is unproven till it's done. And so what you need to do is have that credibility and be able to execute, to be able to deliver, to actually make it come alive. And the key to it, if I may just add, is actually to know what matters. What we do is we often <laughs> A nice give, plug for your book. Well, no, it is, is the name. There's a reason I chose it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But ultimately, the key to everything, I think, is to understand what the very few things that really matter and will matter when you write your obituary or when you arrive five years later or when Inc. does the article about mm-hmm. you. What are the two or three or four things that they're going to say that you did to get wherever you got to? And then did you actually do it? Mm-hmm. Can you actually share from your book? I mean, I love this part of your book, and you could say it much more beautifully about what motivated that and the the death of your own parents and the perspective. I, I often find many of the things I do in business came from my own personal life, and they're not all that different. They go back and forth, and logical things work in a similar fashion. So for me, my parents passed away 25, 30 years ago. I watched both of them essentially die. And in watching them go through that process, I came to conclude there is a judgment day. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you there's a judgment day up there. That's a spiritual decision we all make. But there's a judgment day that you will make if you have chronic illness and that opportunity. And that judgment will be an evaluation of your own life. And watching them go through that, I said, the time to have that judgment day to review your life is not in the ninth inning with two outs. It's in the seventh inning, the fifth inning, the third inning, why you can still do it. And what that led me to begin to do in my own life is what I called a pre-mortem. I would sit down every Christmas and I'd spend three or four days and I'd ask myself, where do I personally want to be in my own relationships, my relationship with my body and my health, my relationships with my family, my children, my wife, my relationships with my work and what I was doing at work, and then ultimately my own spirituality. And from that vision of where I wanted to be in three years, I would literally write initiatives, what did I want to get done this year, and projects that I wanted to get done in this quarter. And then I would go back and evaluate myself each quarter. And I usually got about 75 or 80% of it done. And if I didn't, I held myself accountable. And I began to apply that same discipline to business. And so every business we're involved in has a very clear statement about what it's trying to do to go to market, how it's going to win, what it's going to deliver, and most importantly, what is its its essence. And then from there, we break it down into initiatives and projects, and we hold ourselves accountable, and we run and manage the company to that. Well, Sonera, you also had a pretty significant transition, um, you know, recently stepping down as CEO from Stacks and uh, selling the company to a PE firm. You were running the company for about 10 years, yes. right? Um, and everything was going great. You're building and you built a unicorn. And then what happened? I, I just appreciate just sitting in this room and just listening to you, Ron, right now. I feel like it's the advice is it's so true. And I feel like everything that you've said, although my journey is, you know, in that third inning right now, everything that you're saying are all the things that I ended up having to reflect upon. And I wish that I had that advice earlier when I started before I started. I didn't know that, as I mentioned, to go was going to go build a billion dollar business. Every single day I showed up with that determination, with that execution, because there's no such thing as a billion dollar idea, only a billion dollar execution. Everyone can have ideas. Ideas don't make you an entrepreneur. Execution does. That came from being an immigrant kid. I think it's super, super important part of my story and my brother's story in building this company. A lot of those values of what Ron talked about of, you know, his personal life shape him in his business. Those exact values are what shaped stacks in mine and my brother's journey in building this business. And I do contribute 
the success of that business, not just to the execution, but truly to the team that we built, the culture that we had, and the values at which we built that company. And it was extremely difficult. I felt like the odds definitely were stacked against us to win. From raising venture capital out of Orlando, Florida, to raising venture capital as a woman, as a woman of color, in order to create partnerships at the size of Visa, a MasterCard, like it was a big feat to go build this venture. And we did it. And I think one of the things was honestly some of the naivete of like, why not? And <laughs> now I look back and I'm like, I can't believe we're going to go do it again. But I do think that that naivete was part of, you know, why not us and just going for it and getting in the right rooms. To talk about that, the transition, I think the journey part was important. So as I was building, I also felt that we were told almost what every next step needed to be. And I felt that that was also part of my journey as I was being placed in these, you know, what should be my next steps. One of the things I do say what I'm going to do. And so when I sign up for a plan, I deliver upon the plan. And every year that's, it was just heads down execution. But when I looked up and it was series, you know, B and C and D, and it wasn't just these fictitious valuations. Like when I left the company, we did 140 million in SaaS recurring revenue. We had 40,000 customers running 40 billion in payments through this platform. That was just that idea in 2014. But the day of like when we announced the Series D funding, the unicorn status, the sell to the private equity, you know, there was a big party and we were, had all of the accolades. Everyone covered us, all of the big things. Look at what these two minority founders did. Look at what this, you know, in fintech, what we've done. And it was well-deserved and all of that. But as soon as the party was done and as soon as the press was finished and then, you know, everyone went back home and it was just like all everything that you think that you're working hard for, you raise the bar, you raise the bar, you raise the bar, you raise the bar. And then you get there. And I will tell you that I felt the emptiest and the loneliest and the saddest that I've ever felt in my life was actually post achieving the one thing that I set out to actually go achieve. And it was those things that you were talking about, Ron, of asking yourself, like, what is actually important? Why, what do I want to be known for? I don't want to be known for the girl that built the unicorn. I want to be, and that is important. I do think representation matters and I'm so proud of what I've built. But I wanted to be known for much more than that. And I didn't want to just go, you know, turn when I got my next board plan and it was going from the one billion to two. That passion and that excitement into building that just was not there in that part of my journey. And I took this big sabbatical to Europe. And I think this is like I, I, I'm like on the beach in the Caribbean, right, where you like <laughs> need to you just really need to pull yourself away. And Best work is done in the shower. Yes. And so I, I had and I had and I have two young daughters, as I had mentioned, and I had not actually really spent time in just being with myself post it all and just being with the family and I just, in that moment, like when we were all together and I was finally unplugged from all of the things and it was getting ready for next year's plan, I just knew in my heart that I could not lead the company in the way that I had led it because I had a different level of just that maniacal, you know, vision and drive to get it to that point. But when my vision now didn't align with the private equities vision of what was ahead, I knew that was going to be a challenge. And so that was a foresight that I felt like I had in that moment. And I could force myself into getting into the role because I should be, right? Because I should be happy, because I should lead the company and I should do this and I should do that. And I have this opportunity. But I went back and at the next the board meeting said that I, I think it's time to plan my secession. And we went into into planning that. It was honestly the best decision, not only for myself, but I do believe for, for the company as well. And I'm so proud of what I've built. There was a lot of fear in doing so, but I did the thing. And I'm happy to share what that next identity. The last thing I'll say is like, what was so scary is you put your entire, or you think, and Ron, tell me if I'm crazy in saying this, but like your work becomes your worth. And that's what, yes. what was taking place. And for the first time when I finally was like, oh, shit, I don't want my worth is so much more right. than just my work. It's a really dangerous trap Yeah, that we all fall into because no. we get so many accolades. And yet it's not who you are. Yeah, You're not the business you built. You're the life you live. You're the family you've raised. You're the relationships you have. And most importantly, it's all about your self-respect. Yeah. So that was it. So that was that was the moment. That's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. One thing you've mentioned before that I've thought a lot about is knowing yourself and knowing what you're good at and what you thrive in. And could you just speak more to that about what coming out of that experience taught you about 
what you're best at? Oh, my God. I think one of the things, and I don't know if this, I I mean, I do know, I think as women in particular, we are so hard on ourselves constantly. Like, I think our perfectionism holds us back. I think the... You think we men are not perfectionists? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, Ron, let's, let's go there. No, but I think we've been taught to be perfectionists, Ron. So I do think that, you know, I wanted, I, I'm not saying that successful people or type A humans are not uh-huh. perfectionists, but I think... You might want to check with some of the people that have worked with me <laughs> on that question. <laughs> go-getters, go-getters for sure, for sure. But I do believe that as an overall, as women, I, has, I have to stand here and say that society has trained us all to be perfectionist. And those are some of the things that, that hold us back or we don't take credit for, right, Christine? And so I think early on, I remember going to the board meetings or like this, you know, investor meetings. And I tried, I always say I was like a man in a skirt for some reason. Like I would try to show up, like try to be like them and to have like, and I was. Did you lower your voice? I don't don't (laughs) even know. I I will say sometimes like I wore glasses to meetings. Like I do think that I, I changed who I was a little bit, like not fully. And I, and I can understand, I give myself grace of looking back at some of like my early journey as well, because I just wanted to have a seat at the table. And so I was trying, so it was, you know, the a huge part of business life is also the dinners and the networking and the, the recruiting and like the, how many, like you're just always out and about. And I did feel like I was sometimes showing up inauthentically as not Sunny. I was showing up as Sanira and like Sunny is my name, my childhood nickname, but I did feel like I was I say like a man in a skirt. It wasn't until the pandemic. um, And I remember like a distinct moment where our company was scaling so fast. We had so much growth ahead and we had all of this capital to deploy, like all the things. And then the pandemic hits. And of course, it's the scariest time for all of us, especially as CEOs. We've got teams, we've got, you know, all this stuff. And our investors wanted us to pull back. They wanted to pull pull back spend online. We wanted to pull back and all the right cautionary things that we needed to do. But again, going back to when your gut says something. And I felt like we just had so much momentum that I did not want to lose the momentum. And although there were changes taking place, we just had to pivot and pivot through the pandemic. But I did not want to pull back. And I remember showing up just being like, for the first time, just being so confident in what that moment needed to be for us. And there was a completely different path that everyone else wanted to take and put my badge on the line to say, this is the path that we're going to take through this. And in that moment, when I got that buy-in to say, okay, we support you. Sometimes you're like, you feel like your back is there and you're fighting for it, but you actually don't realize that everyone's all also on your team. And when you get that confidence to say like, no, we're going to trust, we don't agree with it, but we're on the team and we're going to trust this path. I felt like my guard finally was like let down. My armor came off. It was a complete shift that I didn't have to show up as like this person I thought I needed to show up as. I was liked and respected and all of the things, that, all the stories in my head where I had to come like super prepared for everything, super whatever. Like I did feel that level of trust and respect from my board and from, the, you know, from everyone around me to say, yes, let's go do this. And I needed that. I think that that important moment in my career was is, was really instrumental. And we went forward and we had the greatest year. We had triple digit growth through the pandemic. We actually did our first private equity recap at the end of 2020. And then we sold the company again in 2021. So all of those, those decisions were the right key decisions for us at that time. But you have to know it's the strength part is like what you're good at. And I would say, I knew my company. The things that I were, was good at were my customers. The things that I were good at were our people. The thing that I was really good at was marketing. And I knew what was going to take place when everyone was going to pull back their dollars. My dollars weren't going to go forward. And so it is important for you to not just own your CEO, but to really trust in the things that you know and lean in on that. So Sonera mentioned something about just basically kind of losing her ambition to keep going with that company. She moved on. You had a similar situation, Ron, where you were kind of like not quite. Well, you I, you I left your you left seven years. You in left the, same the business company. at some point. You walked away as CEO, and then you were brought back in. I wondered, you know, kind of like how did you stay motivated through these these transitions? I always felt the burden of figuring out what was going to matter tomorrow. Once I went through that process, I'd go, "My God, we've got to do this," and I actually found within myself the need to go do it, to be responsible, to care for the. 100,000 plus team members, employees, uh, to care for the, the billions of dollars of investor capital. And so I took it upon myself to go do it. So you felt the responsibility yeah, to keep going. I, I felt the responsibility to the constituents mm-hmm. to not let them down. And therefore, 
the way to do that was to do what needed to be done to get this business where it needed to be tomorrow. Ron, I just want to add, and not to say that, I mean, I did show up every single day for that company. I think it was a point where also when the vision doesn't align with the board and they also don't want the same vision as you, you can't, and and somebody else owns your company, that's not your company anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the exit piece is so important and critical to understand is because I sold my company. And there's nothing wrong with a private equity space. Like my board and my investors, they're incredible. Like they're, I've left my company in the right hands and I have no qualms with every mandate is different. But a founder's vision and a founder and CEO's vision is much different than when a private equity investor or an investor comes in for a 3x return. Nothing wrong with that. It's just a different way about to go to business. I'd love to hear your... Yeah, I, I, I share that view. Yeah. Uh, the, the, what first I would say, we have to separate building a business from harvesting that business. Mm -hmm. They are separate discussions, and too often we confuse the two. Too many entrepreneurs in today's generation, if I may say, are focused on the value creation, forgetting that value creation is a byproduct. Mm -hmm. It's not something I can make happen. What I can make happen is building a better competitive alternative. That's the end. That's growing a company. That's building a company. Stay focused on that. If you do that, there will come opportunities along the way, if you so wish it, to harvest it. But you've got to step back and separate the two. Now, the one point I would make if I were to have been advising you is too often people think of valuation as fundraising, capital raising, as almost a life cycle event, an annual event like a birthday. We got to get out there. We got to raise money. We got to get that valuation up. The valuation doesn't matter other than the days you buy the stock and the day you sell it. And the reality is for too many people, they forget when they bring partners in, it's the equivalent of having a child with someone. Yes. Right? Once you're in and their money is in there, they have real rights. They have the ability to express an opinion. And so you better be sure you want to have a child and share that child with those folks. And one of the things I often say to business builders is be very cautious about giving up control. It's not the valuation that matters. It's the ability to follow your dream and follow your vision. And all too often, people could do better by having something that's smaller where they have a greater sense of control than having something that's larger, where they lose control and ultimately what gets built is not quite what it could have been. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, or identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations, so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Yeah, no, I fully agree with that. And I think that that is exactly what part of the path when we were going to market in the time that we did, that was a very conscious decision to harvest the business and I sold the business. What I think the difference would have been is that should have been the end of my cycle there. And I do want to come back to the valuation piece because I don't agree. It's not about the valuation. That's what I mentioned. I mean, built a $140 million business. I built a great business that was right. then valued That's what for. matters. That's what matters. And so I do think that there's just different paths Like, and I appreciate this, like, open, transparent dialogue of companies. Like, I would say that if I were to look back and I don't want to change anything, but maybe upon the next business that I built, it's not even about where the transaction took place. But when you essentially give up control, that is when you have to be okay with someone else's decisions. It's not a lesson that I, I I knew I was signing up for that. It was at the point I still felt that I could still continue on as CEO. It was also part of the requirements of doing the transaction. How long do I continue to then be an employee of the company? That was a decision that then I then I had to make to say, okay, it's no longer for me that I need because I already I already had made that decision. I was happy with that decision of harvesting the business and selling the business. Right. And and, and, and oftentimes scenario. you don't get to pick. You don't get to choose how you exit, right? Well, like well, when you're publicly traded, you have shareholders, you have to be responsible to Yeah, but you do get to choose, if I may say And also activist investors, yeah, which you've had a fair yeah, which dealing we can, with. Which we'll talk about. Mm-hmm. But you do get to choose when you're selling the company. You do get to choose who your investors are, at least initially. 
you do get to choose what you're going to do and what you're not and how you think about capital. I, I, I will share with you all something else. This is the, the issue of an IPO. I speak to two or three people a week about IPOs. I can tell you, 90% of the CEOs that take a company public live to regret it. Now, I, I, it was great for me. It was, it's been a phenomenal experience for Kava, which we, we just helped take public. It's been an extraordinary experience. But most people aren't prepared to be in a public company. And what happens in a public company is your constituents grow. The people that are making demands of you grow in extraordinary ways. You end up having investors that are focused on next week's comps and next inflection point, all the way to long-term investors like our friends at T. Rowe Price that are in it for 5 and 10 or 20 years. And the pressures on you become even more intense because everything is exposed. Everything is visible. And my metaphor for, for an IPO, it's a little like a wedding celebration. All too many people focus on getting to the wedding celebration. What really matters is what happens after the wedding is over, after everybody's gone home, and are you prepared to deliver in that relationship with your now public shareholders? Because if you're not prepared to deliver, you're going to have a flawed marriage and a very painful divorce, if I may say so. You've also said some interesting things about when you're publicly traded, you have obviously shareholders you need to be responsible to, but your employees don't necessarily care that you have shareholders you need to be responsible to. Well, I think it's the it's the quandary of any business leader, any CEO. Uh-huh. The reality is I've yet to ever hear a team member, an employee, tell me, Ron, I'm so excited. We made another penny a share for our shareholders. <laughs> they don't Woo! give a hoot. My job as a CEO mm-hmm. is helping create meaning in what we're doing. My job is trying to give a perspective that they can choose or not choose to sign up for. My job is creating systems and structures, compensation systems that allow them and their self-interest to align with the self-interest of what we're trying to do for our shareholders. And the good companies are able to do that in both a financial sense and an emotional sense. The truth is, and I think many of your listeners will know this, I know you do, most of our team members give us 30 or 40 or 50 percent of what they're capable of. And the really good CEOs are able to help them see why giving 70, 80, 90, 100 percent of what they're capable of is actually in their self-interest. And ultimately, because it's in their self-interest, they do it and it inures to the benefit of the shareholder. I want to just pivot, though, to um, what you do when the company is not in your hands anymore. Um, I am a I have such an affection for the Obon Pound brand. So many great memories of life. Being a college student, being pregnant and eating your chocolate chip cookies. Like I could go on and on about how your brand has just been part of so many joyful moments. My first child. <laughs> <laughs> but once you left, and I want to be very clear, this was after you left the company. I was with the Boston Globe Spotlight team. I investigated lettuce. I was the front page investigation on Spotlight. And we had to get into Panera. And the- Panera or, or Obon Pound? Uh, Panera, the kind of E. coli outbreaks. This is after you left the company, but this is your second, I don't know if I should call second, your second, second child. child. Yes. <laughs> yes. How you reconcile that for someone who has put their heart and soul into a brand. And I come from this as, as a place of infection for your brand, but also as an investigative reporter who reported on the foodborne illness outbreaks that Panera was dealing with after your departure. You had to read these headlines. How do you reconcile that as a founder and those feelings of of other leadership taking your child and leading it the way they did? Yeah, I, I, I think you do as an adult. And you recognize that you do what you can about what you can. I couldn't, the hardest thing for me actually was protecting the team members that were, that were still there, left behind after I left, and protecting the, the vision, the dream that I'd spent much of my life working on, the values around clean food, around an approach to the marketplace. And the truth is when you step down or when you sell, you give up that control. And so what I tried to do in the ways I knew best was to be a positive force and to be a positive influence but also to recognize within myself the limits of what I can and can't do. 
And Sonera, um, having stepped back yourself, can you speak a little bit about what it's like to watch somebody else run run your I, baby? I really appreciate what Ron said. It was beautifully said, and I can respect your opinion. Like I can respect that so deeply because, one, it is hard. I would say that even if it's your choice, not your choice, whatever else it is, it's your baby. You reference both of your children as babies. And Stax was my first baby. And My son and daughter might take a bit of offense. <laughs> they're, they're used to it. They recognize they're used to they are it. part of the family. They are part of the family. <laughs> They're used to it. I have two daughters as well. They, my, Mila took her first steps in my like in on my office. My kids grew up in the brand and the business. And honestly, my my eldest, she had the hardest time when we told her that like that I'm not going into the office anymore. That you know I'm not going to stacks anymore. And she was like, "Well, what does this mean? Like, why would we sell this? Like, who told you to do this? Like, what about the company?" And she's just like, she was actually so emotionally even tied as like, and I didn't even think about that a six year old would have such emotions about. She was like, why aren't we going to the office after? Like, I would pick them up from school and take them back. And it was hard. It was hard to let go, I would say, of the day-to-day. It, I'm still in, like, my first year and, like, half of transition right now, right? So I literally still drive to the office without thinking about it. Like, there, there's, like, yes, there's, like yes, the day-to-day so. stuff. I bother, like, literally for the first few months, they're like, please stop emailing us. Like, we've got this. We've got this. Like, so there's, like, the— there's like Giving the, up my email. Uh, giving up the—oh, my God, people still email, and I don't have that email anymore. There's a lot of transition in that way. But what Ron was saying about that emotional release, it's not easy because you put that identity, as I was talking about, as part of it. I'm still learning how to re-identify myself without it. I think what you could do is just trust the right leaders that we've put in place. We have an incredible CEO, Paulette, who's in place at Stacks. I trust in her vision. I trust in her leadership. And I do believe that she's going to take this to the next place that we need it to go. But I would say that there was a lot of turnover what Ron said about people, when you're not there to protect your people, that's the hardest part. And you do everything you can. It doesn't, it's not about you anymore. Like there's a certain point of the company where it used to all be about me. It was all about what we wanted. It was all about the vid. It was all about this stuff. And then there's where it clicks of like, it stops being about the founders anymore. Like now it, it's like, it's for everyone else. And the people really matter who are building it. And that becomes like, that is my family. That is my extended family. I actually have one team was our biggest value in the company and it's tattooed on my arm. And it's it's one team comes from the fact that me and my brother are one team. That translated to the people. When I see things or, you know, I hear about things that are not going so well, all I can be is that positive light and that positive force and always speak highly and make sure that the brand is protected as best as I, there's things that I can control and there's things that you can't control. But as a founder, it's always going to be some part of your identity. And so you do want to be that as positive positive as you can support. And it's the people that you're trying to ensure that you're there to support that. So I know our journeys are, are definitely different in that way, but I feel I feel that and I want my people to be really successful too. You know, Sanira, I have actually a very similar story. Yeah. Not, not different. The morning I was selling my company, I received a note from my son at 19, um, who had also grown up in Panera, spoken at every convention. It was part of him as well. And he was on a gap year in China from uh, Tiger Leaping Gorge. And he writes me, Dear Dad, I know that today you're selling Panera. He said, I know how hard this is for you. I know that your future is ahead of you. I know that there's going to be an opportunity in the future to keep doing good work. You're going to do it in politics. You're going to do it in Tate. Uh, Maybe you'll even help me start a business one day. He said, but the truth of the matter is, change is necessary. The truth of the matter is that I love being with you and mom, but I have to go on in my life and build my own life. And you, dad, have to do the same thing. You have to God, I'm tearing up. <laughs> it was I, I, I did. I loved it. It was the most beautiful thing to get this note from my son that morning. And, and the truth is our kids, my son, was my father that day. I and your that. daughter was, was your mother. She yeah. was speaking to you. I think we also need to give ourselves permission. Like, we don't have to, like, I just, we're allowed to reinvent ourselves. Can we also just put that (laughs) out there? Like, I am allowed to reinvent myself. Like, putting yourself, your needs, and, like, doing that assessment of, like, who do I want to be? And that can change, too, and that needs to change. We actually sold at the height of when we needed to. We made outsized returns. We made 30 millionaires for just our small team. Our team was 250. We, when I left, it was 400. But the first transaction, I mean, we created 18x return for our investors. 
it was incredible. It was an incredible moment for Orlando. It, we, we were the first tech unicorn out of out of Orlando. We we're the first female-led unicorn out of Florida. Like so many great things also happened because of that. And we were on momentum and it was the right time. So I don't regret the the timing so, of it. So as if well. I could say this yeah. to you, no apologies. You don't need yeah. to. The truth of the matter is, once you've sold the company, do something about the things you can. Accept the things you can't and know the difference. Yeah, I don't think I'm, I'm not apologizing. I think I'm tr- trying to share a different perspective yes, okay. of the of an exit and of a different founder's journey as well. Because I know that like, obviously we have like, I know we're very similar. There's a lot of things that are tying us together in different ways. When I'm saying the reinventing ourselves, I just want to offer the entrepreneurs listening in the room that my journey doesn't have to be your journey. Ron's journey doesn't have to be your journey. Every journey of every entrepreneur is actually, it's actually different. And it is different. And your journey is yours to define. And I think if you take away, I know we're, we're talking about exit and all of that, build, right? Build a great business. You get to decide what you want to do with that. And how are you feeling about your legacy these days? Oh my goodness. It has been, it's been such a year. It's been the most amazing thing, honestly, to take a step back. And I really thought, okay, by the way, I thought I was going to retire. I was like, yes, we get to retire at age 36. I'm, you know, young mom. I was like, I'm going to drop my kids to school every day, pick them up from school, love my kids, went on every vacation ever, did all the things in like whatever, these last six months. But how much can you go travel? How much can you go do the things? And so I'm building again. And it is nuts. And it's only been a year. But if you asked me last year, I was like, there's no shot in hell that I'm going to do this ride again. And here we are building again. We're going to be announcing our platform again soon. I'm going to be back in the fintech space. And there's a lot. I think it's the there's a lot to change in financial services, especially when it comes to creating an equitable space in financial services. And so there's still a lot of human decision making that is part of this this ecosystem and this process. And it, there shouldn't be. This should be done through data. And now we have such amazing access to data. And so I'm really excited to create decision making that's based on data and not human biasness so that we can create a more financially equitable world for all businesses. And that's really important. And I, it was frustrating in terms of when we decided to get into the room to say, are we going to do the thing? We have three co-founders. It's myself, Jacques, and Sal. Jacques is our technical co-founder. My brother, Sal, is our like, head of operations, sales, all the things. And I also lead on marketing and vision. And we're just like the most perfect, incredible founding team. We're all doing our things. Jacques actually went on to go do his own thing. I'm like, you know what? I've got this great podcast. I'm going to go empower women, go tell stories, go do that. He picks up the phone and he's like, gives us a location. He's like, plan to be there for two days. We're not leaving. And it was kind of like when the, you pick a pope and you, like, the smoke comes out and you, you leave the building. <laughs> And the first thing he he tells us, he's like, Michael Jordan can go play baseball. Michael Jordan can go get sponsorships and dollars, and he's an amazing athlete, so he can go build a podcast or go build the ed tech or go do this or do the next things. And everyone's going to support Michael Jordan because he's Michael Jordan. But Michael Jordan should not go play baseball. He needs to go win more championships. And that was it. And I'm like, okay, you're right. Didn't he play ba- baseball? Yes. He did. <laughs> He did. Like a memory he service. did. He he should be winning more winning championships. That was kind of the moment we're like, okay, we're gonna get back together. We're gonna go fix what were the biggest problems that we faced, and not in our specific industry, so but in just in general and as a business. And so we decided to go and and tackle it again. And here we are, just in stealth and building and ready to no launch. No longer us. stealth. I know. Almost. Well, you don't know what it is. Cat's so it's out gonna, of the bag. Yeah, cat, cat, cat's not out of the bag yet. How so are you gonna do it differently? Without, you know, even giving us, how is it going to be different this time? It's going to be different because I I come from experience now. I think that's the difference. It's not, I don't know what's ahead, so that's not going to change. I don't know what the troubles are going to be. I don't know what this, like, there's a lot of still unknowns. There's so much uncertainty always. But this time, I come from experience, and I think that's what's going to catapult us so much faster. Experience comes from wisdom. Uh, Wisdom comes from banging your head against the wall. (laughs) That's why I'm bald. (laughs) Well, um, we we talked a little bit about your father and, um, you know, sort of the first part of your book, you talk about, you know, seeing him on his deathbed. And he had this moment of feeling like he was being judged and he did not like how he was looking at himself. How he judged himself. Right. He reviewed his life. So the question is, how would you judge your life so far? I feel so blessed in so many ways. I have had the chance to do really interesting work, work with really interesting people. I've had two beautiful children. One of the price of it was a a divorce. 
-hmm. My marriage uh, of 25 years uh, broke down. Um, but, but I would say to you, if I look at the whole of, of everything, I couldn't have imagined a more blessed life. The one thing I, I feel some profound sadness about and it's a, a broader question is, as somebody who's 70 years old, I look at the world we're leaving our kids, I really feel a, a sense of failure. I, I, I you know, my, my generation had so much promise, and I look at this world, and, you know, with climate change and, and economic inequality and, and, and the pain, maybe it's always been that way, but I, I'm just, I'm looking around, and I'm going, wow, how does this society, how does this planet go on for another hundred years? Mm -hmm. And is there a better way to be doing this? Well, that's the beauty of entrepreneurship. Like, you know, yeah. these people just constantly want to do something better, make change. So you actually do have the power, even though you're 70. You know, you've been working toward um, investing in other companies. We are. Are you doing something about it? Yeah. I mean, I would say to you, I have this other side political. Mm -hmm. And I got very involved. I was one of the co-founders of a group called No Labels which is trying to reduce the hyperpartisanship, trying to help our young people get more nuanced, less black and white, to be able to listen, to be able to talk, to have empathy, to understand there's another point of view, to understand we've got to step back and solve problems and not just blame the other person. I see it all over. And so for me, after I sold Panera, I essentially was doing a great deal of speaking on the pervasive short-termism in our capital markets. Ultimately, I said, you know what? I should take my own money and put my money where my mouth is. And I ended up creating an investment vehicle. I took my money, and it's just our partner's money, the people I work with, and we call it Act 3. And it made significant investments. Well, it, its model is basically only investing where we have competitive advantage, where we have better knowledge. We invest in categories in, in food and entertainment, which we know five years and 10 years from now are going to have tailwinds. And then we help build the dominant brand in those categories. So we did it in Mediterranean. It didn't take a, a genius to know Mediterranean is the number one diet in America. Bold flavors, but familiar. I knew this five and 10 years ago. I made a small investment in a company called Kava. After I sold Panera, I actually went with to them with the idea of buying a public company five times larger than them to build the dominant brand in the business. And we had a phenomenal CEO in Brett Shulman, and he and his team took off. And they, you know, as I think many people know, we took it public um, six months ago. And it was probably the most successful restaurant IPO. Uh, it's trading well up from its IPO price. We're doing the same thing in Plan Forward Eating. We have a concept called Life Alive, which we know has the potential to be a dominant company in a category I am quite convinced over the next five to 10 years is going to emerge with powerful tailwinds. It's going to be strong. Third, we're doing it in upscale bakery cafes. We have a concept called Tate, uh, a founder, a Zaridor. It speaks from a Middle Eastern, Israeli, Lebanese, Turkish voice. It has authority in artisan coffee, authority in European and Middle Eastern baked goods, and it has chefs in every restaurant. And it's touching people. It's in D.C., it's in Boston. We know this is going to be a dominant brand in this category. And then finally, we're investing in experience-based or challenge-based entertainment. People of, of a younger generation, they want to get out. They want physical experiences. And this is 40,000 square feet of challenges 40 or 50 different mental and physical challenges. Like gladiators? No, 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 no. No, it's not, not that at all. It's not like uh, American Ninja. It's, it's actually one to three minutes. They're often mental. Some of them are physical, you, you know, they're experiential. And we want to get out and have experiences because we're caught on those machines. Right. But all I can tell you, it's not me. You can look at, at things like Put Shack and, 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 and Meow Wolf, they're all part of what we would now call immersive or experiential entertainment. It's a category with great tailwinds. We're going to build the dominant player, I think, in that category with something called Level 99. Because our skill, and very simply, I'm just doing what I've always done. Identify what the deeper trends are and then understand how to build smartly with a long-term focus mm -hmm. the concept that's going to win in Your that Your Michael category. Jordan winning championships. I was going to say. Yeah. I, I mean, I... I you yeah. are. 
<laughs> this is amazing. It's what you, it's putting what you know to use in the category that you can do it in, right? So you're not out here being like, I can do everything. You're like, here's what I know, what I can do, and really make an impact in the things that I can make an impact for. And I think that that is, that's the way. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the, the irony of it all is it doesn't feel like work anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm used to work running a public company, 150% of a normal person. Maybe you can help me in the next, and maybe this time I'll, I'll try public this time. Well, oh, God. I, I mean, <laughs> you're not scared off by this? No, it's part it's of it different. is to be, a, I actually love it. Yeah. And part of it is to know yourself and to actually ask that question, if this were the end, how do you feel about that? So this is a question that sounds like it's just about bread, but it's not really about bread. It's more about business. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> How did you know with the whole bread is the devil, you know, culture, Atkins. The whole, like Atkins, you stuck with that road of Oban Pan and Panera. And there are a lot of bread naysayers that we've had over the last two decades. So how did you know that people would still be eating bread and keep that going when there was such a cultural shift away from that? And you had this vision. I listened to customers and I would walk into Panera Bread in the middle of Atkins, in the middle of the whole keto movement. I'd see people in the stores eating and I'd walk up and say, what are you doing in Panera? Didn't you hear about Atkins and the keto diet? And they say, oh no, I still come here. I love their soup or I love your, 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 your salads. And I began to understand that for people, the bread defined our credibility, but it wasn't what we were selling and that people were responding to these products. And so, so much of my knowledge, so much of my sense of confidence comes from listening to customers. That's where you build competitive advantage and competitive advantage is everything. Now, having said that, I must tell you a story. In the middle of Atkins, I used to go to bed at night and just say, I just hope I wake up at four in the morning and somebody tells me it's actually coffee that isn't good for you and bread that is. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, keep dreaming. So I'd love to have us wrap up with a sort of a question for both of you. What would be your best you know, parting wisdom for folks who are just jumping on to the entrepreneurship and, you know, thinking about one day, you know, how am I going to start, run, grow, exit my company? I would say don't really start with the exit in mind. I know this whole episode was a lot about the exit focus over here and the different forms of exit. Don't worry about the exit in mind. Build a great business and focus, like maniacal focus on that execution. Build the right team around you. Do the right thing and keep going. Right. So do the right things and keep going. If I look back and you know my journey is the 10 year journey so far, but the people that make it, it's not because they had this silver bullet or had like I didn't have this perfect answer or this thing that went viral or the, you know, this business article that, you know, that Inc. published that like now I had all the investors and the customers there. There weren't these answers like that. And sometimes as an entrepreneur, I always felt like when I had the next 10 employees or 100 employees or when I had this investor or when I had this customer, when I had this partnership, then it would all be successful. The biggest myth about entrepreneurship is it doesn't get easier. It doesn't. But you just get better, right? You get better. And so just trust in yourself. Keep one foot of the in front of the other and keep solving problems like your job every day is going to be to solve problems. And the quicker that you can acknowledge that that's your job, your job is to solve problems and getting comfortable in solving problems. That is how you keep going. So don't worry about the exit in mind, just build a great business and you'll know when you get there. And Ron? Before I do, I just want to talk about something you were speaking to, which we haven't fully shared today. And that's the reality of the entrepreneurial or business building experience. The truth is it's not for the faint of heart. It's really, really tough. And the truth of the matter is, if you think about it, it's not about the rewards you get at the other end. It's about the process and joy of doing it. And the truth is, the business owns you. You don't own it. It owns you when you're in the shower. It owns you when you're on vacation. It owns you when you're taking care of your child at three in the morning. It owns you. And so one of the things I caution people all the time, if you don't love the doing of the doing, If you're doing it for an outcome out the other end, you're never, ever going to get there. So try to decide what it is that you value, how you want to spend your life, and whether you you have real joy in what it is that your enterprise is all about. Don't think about the exit. That's a great way to end it there. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for joining the podcast today. Thank Thank you you so much. Thank you. That's all for today's episode of Inc. Uncensored. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. 
Spotify, or your podcast platform of choice. Also, if you liked this episode or have suggestions of what topics you'd like to hear about, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Or reach out to us on Inc.'s social channels on LinkedIn, Instagram, and the app formerly known as Twitter. Inc. Uncensored is produced by Julia Shu, Blake Odom, and Avery Miles. Mix and sound design by Nicholas Torres. Our executive producer is Josh Christensen. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.